Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was just to make sure the licorice had gone down. So she was wondering. So here we are in, our, in the third of our series on Ephesians, and I'd like to set the scene for you with what Paul is talking about. So, Chris, if we could have the first image, please. David, have you got your mic switched on? Yeah. Yep, yeah, should be. Should be there now. Yeah. Excellent. Right. I won't repeat the licorice thing I said. So if you want to understand what Paul is now talking about, this is where we find ourselves. Um, most of you will have had the experience. Uh, you finally, finally find a parking space. Yes! You pull up, you get in, you get out, and you see something like that. You had that experience? Yeah. So you get back in, and you reverse out, and you go elsewhere. If you're lucky, this is making a noise, isn't it? Is that any better? Okay, we'll try that. Because it says permit holders only. You are not allowed to be there. There are only a few people who are allowed to be there. How does that make you feel? Annoyed. Annoyed, said Simon, with feeling. <laughs> Annoyed. How else does it make you feel? Excluded. Excluded, so you feel excluded. You feel annoyed. You know, why can't I park it? I'm not allowed. It's not for me. And that experience of exclusion is where Paul the Jew is really rooting himself and getting excited and enthusiastic with what God is going to say to the people. Because Paul digs deep into the Old Testament promises, not least, I think, in Isaiah, where the image and vision is of a God who loves everybody, a God who welcomes everybody as long as you're part of the chosen people. And Paul the Jew, when the Christians got started, really enforced this way of thinking that, uh, 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 our God ain't for you. It's for us. And then the miracle happens and Paul is overwhelmed by Christ and sees things differently. So the next one, Chris, if we could... And so Paul says to those who are not like we are, to those who are always the outsiders, he says, your experiences as Gentiles, because there were the Jews and Gentiles. In our house, if we go for a walk and you see a bird of some feathered description flying around, the joke was, it's a not owl. If you think about it, it's either an owl or it isn't an owl. It works, trust me, every time, without fail. It's either an owl or a not owl. What we've got here is you're either a Jew or a not Jew. You're either in or you're out. And Paul is reaching out to those who were formerly excluded and saying, look, your experience has been, you have been Gentiles, you have lived like aliens and strangers. And just imagine what that is like. To live as a stranger in a society. To live as someone who is alien to the way things are done. What it is not to have the permission to belong. And that's a real issue in our world and our society at present, isn't it? When we think of migration, we think of immigration, we think of diversity, it's a huge issue. And for so many people, they feel themselves to be aliens and strangers. And Paul is breaking through everything that would keep us from each other. And he says to them, look, I realise you were without Christ. You know what it is to have no hope to be without God and worse, to feel yourself far off. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Paul shows great empathy for these people, the ones he would formerly have wanted to persecute. Now he wants to welcome. Now he's standing in their shoes. Now he is saying, yes, you were without Christ. The whole reason for being, you had no hope. You were far off without God. 
Next one, Chris, if we could. And what Paul is doing is showing what religion looks like when religion becomes a barrier. And one of the, the greatest criticisms by those who don't have faith, of those who do, is all that religion gets wrong, and religion is a barrier, isn't it? Religion is a cause of war and conflict. Well, this is in Hull. Does anybody recognise it? I tell you, the first time I saw that, it, I was really shocked. Where is it, Sharon? It's not far from Hedden Road. It's, this is Jennings Street. And it's the Jennings Street Bridge. It's where Banksy put his artwork. On that raised deck. Bottom left-hand corner, that's where uh, Banksy put his famous artwork. But the first time I saw that, it took my breath away. Because I thought, hang on a minute. There is absolutely no way of getting across the river at this point. I'd never seen anything like that, have you? Because it's permanently like that. Permanently like that. You cannot... Get across, and it just looks, it's mind-blowing, doesn't it? You cannot, you cannot use it. It's just there, it's a barrier. And this is what Paul is saying, that religion has been a barrier. The bridge is up, and there is no way across if you're on the wrong side. Next one, if we took Chris. So if we look at this in context, there's the, the deck we just looked at on the right-hand side. Scott Street span on the left. And what's keeping them apart and what is given priority is the River Hull, which flows in between the two. And if you know anything about Hull at all, you will know that there the twain meet. East Hull and West Hull, two incredibly different cultures. You may as well there be standing on the border between Iraq and Iran, trust me. Two different cultures and what keeps them apart is being given precedence, isn't it? Yes. You're not allowed to make the bridge. What keeps them apart, that's what matters more than anything. And that speaks into the world at the moment, doesn't it? The things that keep us apart are being fueled. And how do we get together? Religion, for Paul, is now a barrier, keeping people from God's love. So the next one, Chris, if we could... And then there is this amazing but moment. Because Paul understands that what has happened in Jesus is something quite extraordinary. Now when I did my pastoral theology and was trained in college, we were told never to use but. You know what those conversations are like? You say something and the person you're talking to says, but. And it shuts things down. But Paul wants to shut down discrimination and separateness. And what Paul is saying is, but, it's a huge but that stops everything. He said, but, what's happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus, his blood being spilt, his sacrifice, that has once and for all shattered what would keep us apart. It's redefined what religion is. It's opened up. And made a bridge for people to come and know just how much God loves them. The old exclusive ways have gone forever. And that that includes everyone. Everything has changed in what God has done in Jesus. Amen. Next one, Chris, if we could. And Paul says, there is now from this moment a new humanity. So God gets his spray can, Banksy-esque, rainbow sprays over the divisiveness and the things that keep us apart. And says, that is not in my name. This is not about me. There are no longer Jews and Gentiles. There are no longer in and out. In Christ, I have made one new humanity. And that's our truth. And that's what we live today. That's how we see each other. No longer the bridge like that, but one humanity and God's passion that we should live from the truth of it. And that is what enthuses Paul. 
to do what he did. Why else would he go across the Mediterranean as he did and the known world at that time? With such passion, commitment, dedication, being outrageous, being locked up, being imprisoned. It's because he's got this vision of how life should be in Christ and nothing will keep him from sharing it. Next one, Chris. And so this is what Paul offers to the world. Can you imagine rocking up at a parking space and seeing that? <laughs> How would you feel? <coughs> you know, if you've driven three, four hours to come on holiday in Scarborough, <laughs> and you saw that, you'd think, yes, Yorkshire is truly God's own county. Look <laughs> at this. Everyone is welcome. And that's what Paul puts in front of the whole of humanity. For he says, look, you're no longer strangers, you're no longer aliens, you're no longer excluded, but you're citizens, you're members, you're heirs, you're sharers in what God is doing. This is your birthright, this love of God, because in Christ you're reconciled, you're brought near, the barriers are broken down, the things that kept us apart <coughs> are abolished. There's no room for doubt here, is there? Paul is just right on it. And he's telling us, everything has now changed. We are one humanity where everyone is welcome in Christ. Next one, Chris. A few words. There is now, and this is astonishing, one body, one spirit, one holy temple. What would the world look like if our politics reflected that? Just think about it. What would the world look like if we took this seriously, that in Christ we are all one, there is just one spirit, we're together, there is no exclusion, because in Christ we are joined together, built together, and most radically, each of us now is a dwelling place for God. And we should honour each other as being someone in whom God's love is at work. Everyone welcome. Next one, Chris, if you would. So what Paul offers is a paradigm shift. Huge, massive, epic paradigm shift for the church. No longer are we about barriers, but we are about bridges. We are built up and held in the love of Christ who is our cornerstone. And we are built in him and shaped through the spirit <coughs> to be a bridge. There's the dear old Humber Bridge. Joining Yorkshire to Lincolnshire. Who would have thought? <laughs> the political sweetener in the 1960s represents for us that paradigm shift that we all matter. No bridges for the church, sorry, no barriers, but only bridges here on in. Reaching out and being ourselves, <coughs> rooted in Christ, the means of drawing together all those God loves. Next one, Chris, if you will. So this is our vocation here in this church, says Paul. This is our purpose. This is why we are raised up. This is our mission. This is our vocation. Church as a bridge. Reaching out to those who think they don't belong. Reaching out to those who need to be transformed by the love of God. Reaching out and transforming communities with love and passion and service and commitment. Reaching out, never stopping people coming into contact with the love that alone can save them. Next one, Chris, if you would. And so Paul ends this section with three huge statements which really do define what Burniston Methodist Church should be doing. So buckle up, strap in. Because this is what Paul is saying to us. Paul is convinced that he has a commission 
of God's grace. That God's grace is everything for him. It's filled him, it's transformed him, it's forgiven him. He has a commission. So do we here in this church. We have a commission of God's grace. Clear and simple and straightforward. And it's this. To bring to the Gentiles of our time the news of the boundless riches of Christ. To make sure that no one misses out on knowing for themselves those incredible riches which set us free, in which we're known, in which we're loved, in which we're transformed, in which we can be the human face of Jesus for those who doubt their worth or doubt that they belong. That's the commission Paul gives to the church to reach out and to take that news. So mission is our DNA, people. That's why this church is here. It's never been about church going, has it? <coughs> it's been about following Jesus and living as he lives. With all that passion of being bridge builders. Next one, Chris, if you would. And it gets even more exciting because our role here at Berniston is to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. By which he means that as church we should shine out and be absolutely clear standing up for what God wants to do and achieve. And the mystery is that God is reconciling all things to himself. That God is bringing us together as one humanity. That God is pouring his spirit out for those who most need it. So we're up front about why we're here. We're up front about what our mission is. There is no doubt about what Berniston Methodist Church stands for. Do you get it? Do you see it? It's a challenge, isn't it? But isn't it great? God is changing the world through you and me. As we share God's boundless riches for those who doubt that they deserve it. And those who need it. As we are up front about what God wants to do at the heart of all life. Which is bring us together. God's plan is seen in its beauty and its wonder. And the last one please. And Paul gives us this epic, so that. We've had his but, now we get his so that. Through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What Paul means by that is, bring it on. Bring it on. Because Paul understands that in Christ, God has already defeated evil and wickedness and the powers of darkness. And later on in Ephesians, we'll return to that theme which Paul has. But here he's saying what God has done in Christ has cosmic, universal, heavenly significance. And the church lives in the truth of that, that we have nothing to fear. And we proclaim our gospel in Christ to the whole of existence, to heaven itself, the church, the bridge through which the reality of God's inclusive grace is known, is echoed into heaven and to all those who would keep us apart. A universal cosmic challenge to evil and wickedness. Knowing that God's love is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Permit holders only? Or everyone welcome? A barrier? Or a bridge? Confident, passionate, focused in mission? Or just sitting here on a Sunday? Paul doesn't give us a choice. He leads us by the hand. 
to inhabit this amazing vision in Ephesians. And if ever there is anything the world needs to hear, it is this, through you and me, now, in our time.